Hello world, I'm Apples and Dragons, and this is Grey Sheep and Hedge Wizards, my Song of Ice and Fire show, where I talk about a Song of Ice and Fire. And if you have not read all of these books, go away. Today I'm going to be talking about The Night of the Laughing Tree, Part 7. And, uh... This episode is going to be different than the Night of the Laughing Tree episodes before it. Instead of saying what I think, I'm going to read what the audience thinks about who is the Night of the Laughing Tree and the tourney at Hall in general, with a focus on the Night of the Laughing Tree mystery. As you'll all know by now, the story of the Night of the Laughing Tree is told by Mira Reed to Grand Stark in A Storm of Swords. It's page 282, or thereabouts. Mostly I'm going to be looking at conversations that happen on Reddit r slash a song of ice and fire, Reddit r slash pure song of ice and fire, which is a book only subreddit. And I think I included one thread from westeros.org, just for a little diversity. And all the threads we're going to look at are organized chronologically, from oldest to newest. Starting back from 11 years ago, and moving forward to days or months ago. And basically what I want to do is to try to give you a sense of what the Night of the Laughing Tree discussions are like, what the arguments are like, trends and what people think, what they argue about, and trends and how those trends have changed over time or stayed the same. I think that's everything I needed to say in the intro. So without further ado, let's dive in. I'm so excited. Here we go. This thread is called Night of the Laughing Tree Analysis. And it's from 11 years ago. On r slash a song of ice and fire. It says, I am of the opinion that the only person who could be the Night of the Laughing Tree was Lyanna Stark, whom Howland Reed all but confirms in the retelling of the story from his daughter. Unfortunately, any conclusive evidence to confirm or disconfirm our suspicions was lost with many of the tournament attendees. So he's saying a lot of the attendees died. Despite the tourney occurring only 15 years ago, most of its attendees that we know of are passed away. Jamie was present, but sent home the first night, making him irrelevant. We are left with only five men with whom we have any realistic chance of gaining first-hand knowledge, or insight into the tournament. Mace Tyrell, John Connington, Jan Royce, Howland Reed, and Barristan Selmy. With this group, however, it is reasonable to conclude that we may never hear from Mace or Jan about this matter, seeing as how their proximity to, and interest in, the Starks were both very limited. John Connington presumably had his eyes on matters of more importance to notice namely Rhaegar's bum. <laughs> and we have no reason to believe that Barristan was focused on anything else but the lists. Okay, maybe that Dane girl. He's referring to Ashara Dane. So no reliable witnesses remain with us. Because there is no one in a position to refute Howland's claims, regardless of their authenticity, we must welcome a critical analysis of his story and the possibility of him exaggerating certain events, as Martin has yet to shy away from unreliable narration. We can safely rule out any embellishment on Mira's behalf, for the names used in the retelling suggests a visual identification by the narrator for people that Mira has never met. So I'm going to pause there and scroll down and see how long this is. It's not that long. I'm going to stop there and see what people are saying about it. Top comment is 88, 85 points. I'm basically 99% sure it's Liana. Jamie Lannister at one point talks about how jousting has more to do with horse riding than anything else when talking about Loras Tyrell versus Garland as fighters. Liana is always described as a phenomenal horse rider. Plus, she defended the squires, and then when the Knight of the Laughing Tree wins, he or she says, Teach your squires humility. 
He actually says teacher's squire is honor. So clearly was knowledgeable of the humiliation of the Cranog man. The Knight of the Laughing Tree has awkwardly fitting armor, which would benefit a woman. The booming voice could be interpreted as an artificial attempt at making a man's slash deeper voice. And perhaps clue number one, when Rhaegar is tasked by his father to discover the identity of the Knight of the Laughing Tree, and when he wins the tourney, he crowns Lyanna. This is likely how he fell in love with her, and why he crowns her, finding out her actions and her spirit. I'm really glad this was the, the first post that I read, because what it shows contradicts something that we're going to see people claiming in the, the more recent threads, where some people claim that nobody was saying that it was Lyanna a long time ago. I think certainly fewer people were saying it was Liana a long time ago. And I think that's more true the further back you go. But this post goes back 11 years to May 27, 2012. So it's fairly far. It's three or four years further than when I picked up the story. And we can see already that even in 2012, most people thought the Night of the Laughing Tree was Liana Stark, and by a large margin. This is a quote from Bruce Bolton in A Dance with Dragons that you're going to see referenced a lot. He says, Horses, the boy was mad for horses. Lady Dustin will tell you. Not even Lord Rickard's daughter could outrace him. And that one was half a horse herself. Bruce Bolton, A Dance with Dragons. He says, That quote confirmed it in my mind. And then there's another quote from Lady Dustin that we get. Lady Barbara Dustin says to Theon, uh, talking privately in the Winterfell crypts, Brandon was fostered at Barrowton with old Lord Dustin, the father of the one I'd later wed. But he spent most of his time riding the rills. He loved to ride. His little sister took after him in that. A pair of centaurs, those two. This person says, I'm just throwing this out there, but Benjamin Stark was there too, and I believe he knows something. I think he was close to Lyanna, might have even practiced swordplay with her. He did practice swordplay with her. Uh, that's shown in a vision in A Dance with Dragons, the Brand Seas. If she was capable of doing that well in attorney, he would be even more qualified than Howland Reed to say for sure. So he thinks it might be Benjen Stark. This person says, fun idea. I don't have the books at school with me to really do this dance. But why is it more likely that Lyanna was the knight than Ned? I remember there being a wolf mentioned, Brandon, and a lady wolf, Lyanna, but no smaller wolf, Ned. There's hints in the books and evidence in the show that Ned is better in combat than he lets on, so he may have the prowess to be the knight. All in all, it seems like less of a stretch for the knight to be Ned, or even Howland, than Lyanna. So this post contains uh, the beginnings of a trend that I noticed, too, in the Night of the Laughing Tree discussions. Over time, people just get better at referencing the, the books. He calls Ned the, the smaller wolf. But in the Laughing Tree story, that is not Ned's um, nickname. It's the quiet wolf. And the same with Liana. Her nickname is not Lady Wolf. It's, there's two of them. There's She-Wolf and Wolf Maid. And he just doesn't remember Brandon's nickname. But Brandon was the wild wolf. So understandably, the longer people discuss this uh, Night of the Laughing Tree mystery, they tend to get better at remembering and referencing what the actual words are in the books. But at the same time, there are constantly new readers picking up the story and um, coming into the discussions for the first time. So there's always going to be people sort of stumbling with the uh, remembering the right words from the books and what all the relevant passages are. But I would say in general, there's a, a noteworthy improvement to the audience's ability to reference the books correctly over the course of the 11 years we're going to be looking at. So that's kind of the end of this thread. That's a short one. Next one. This one's from nine years ago, so we're jumping ahead a couple years. 
February 7, 2014, The Night of the Laughing Tree. So I have a question about this story we hear from Mira. I've read theories around here stating that the Night of the Laughing Tree might have been Liana, or one of the Starks. But to be honest, I don't get it. The Night is described in a story about how a Cranog man who knows magic, or at least learns it after visiting the Werewoods on the Isle of Faces, gets made fun of by some squires at the tourney at Harrenhal. He actually got his butt kicked. It wasn't just getting made fun of. The next day, a short knight with a laughing werewood as a sigil defeats the three knights, and only the three knights, for whom the squires were conscripted. He then tells the knights that to ransom their stuff, they have to teach their squires honor, or something like that. How is the knight anyone but the Cranog man? Probably Howland Reed. I get that the Cranog man was supposed to be small and unskilled at jousting. But the knight is specifically described as small, with armor too big for him. Also, and I could be wrong, but isn't it specifically noted that the Cranog man knows magic? And just came from a location known for its magic and werewood trees? Specifically, the knight's sigil? I also get that Liana had the wolf blood, and was one and was the one who saved the Cranog man from the squires. But is Liana really good enough to defeat three experienced knights? Do we even have any reason to think any of the other Starks were particularly small? And really, is this something that any of them besides Brandon and Liana might do? I don't have a reference, but I certainly don't get the idea that Brandon was small. Finally, the mystery knight disappears, and if I recall correctly, the Cranog man is not mentioned again in the story. Whereas we know Liana was around for the rest of the tourney. Yeah, she could have just ditched the armor and stuck around. It just seems like you have to jump through a lot of hoops to make the knight anyone but the Cranog man. It just seems to me like it's not even supposed to be ambiguous. But then again, I remember Bran didn't seem to make the connection either. So I don't know. So what's up? Are these just the tinfoil sort of theories? If not, what other backing is there? Blah, blah, blah. The top comment says, with 61 points, he says, think about it in terms of its purpose to the story. If the knight is the Cranog man, then it's a pretty pointless aside about a character we've never met, who somehow finds his strength and jousting skills, and stands up for himself. It doesn't even make for a very good standalone story. Why did he let himself get bullied, and why was he agonizing over his inability to fight back, if he had the magical power to do it all along? What was the point of the supporting characters, the wolves? But if it's Liana, then the story serves several important functions. It adds a lot to the character of Liana, who is likely to become important later, given all the mystery surrounding her. It explains the bond between the Reeds and the Starks. It likely answers the mystery of why Rhaegar, who was honorable and had a good wife, suddenly became so infatuated with Lyanna that he dedicated his victory in the tournament to her and started a war. Remember that the king sent him to find the mystery knight. What if he did? Also, consider why the Reed kids were so convinced that Bran would have heard this story from his father a hundred times. Why would they think the Starks would cherish the story an unsatisfying one, as Bran notes, about one of their least noteworthy backwoods bannermen. Because it's a story about the Starks, not the Reeds. He said, Lyanna is the best answer so far, in my opinion. It would also make sense for Ned to not tell his kids if it contained details of Lyanna and Rhaegar falling in love. So the next trend I want to point out starts right here. This is from nine years ago. And the trend is that the theories about Lyanna being the Knight of the Laughing Tree are couched in the theory about Lyanna and Rhaegar being John's parents. And another trend that's sort of a subcategory of that one is that theories where Lyanna is not the Knight of the Laughing Tree. So theories for all of the opposing contenders go out of their way to point out that their theory does not contradict R plus L equals J. 
that r plus l equals j can still be true and meaningful and make a good story without Liana being the Knight of the Laughing Tree. And without the Knight of the Laughing Tree event being when, where, or why Liana and Rhaegar met and fell in love. I should also point out that the official narrative in the story about what happened between Rhaegar and Liana is not that they fell in love. <laughs> it's that Rhaegar uh, kidnapped Liana and raped her. So the fell in love narrative that the audience comes up with it has the satisfying quality of rejecting the narrative that we're given, which is a narrative that in some ways seems like it can't be true. Um, most notably of all because Ned Stark thinks in his thoughts that Rhaegar would probably never visit a brothel, which would be a weird thing to think about the man who raped your sister. Okay, continuing. Without the book on me, I remember it being said that Lyanna was an excellent horse rider. Combined with her wolf's blood, the ill-fitting armor, the small stature, it's not a huge leap for the Knight of the Laughing Tree to be Lyanna. There's probably more I'm leaving out, but I'm at work with no reference. A lot of repeated stuff, mostly about the horse riding and jousting relationship. There's a quote that will come across inevitably, and I'll read it when I do, where Jamie says that, Jamie thinks to himself that jousting is mostly about horse riding skill. And then there are quotes about Liana being a good horse rider. And then those are connected to say that Liana could be a good jouster. If R plus L equals J is true, then it could have started here, which gives some support to Liana. I think it has to be Liana. She is moved by tears by Rhaegar's harp playing. She was shown to be headstrong, stubborn, capable, and likely motivated by the stark sense of honor and duty. Having just reread that chapter yesterday, I found myself thinking the same way you are. This was my first reread since hearing that Liana is the Knight of the Laughing Tree theory, but to me it feels more natural than the Knight of the Laughing Tree was simply the Cranog man. Presumably having learned a bit of magic on the Isle of Faces, it seems more likely that the Cranog man would be able to muster up a booming voice, as opposed to Liana. I'm not ruling out the possibility that Liana could be the Knight of the Laughing Tree, but to me it feels like the re that requires jumping to too many unsubstantiated conclusions. When I first read it, I believed the Mystery Knight was Ned. It struck me as his kind of character, protecting the weak. I also saw it as to the reason Howland was so fond of Ned. Also the reason why Ned never tells his children he doesn't seem to be the kind to brag. Ned had a strong relationship with the old gods. Is it hard to believe he was granted strength from them on the Isle of Faces? Also, when the knight speaks, wouldn't it be apparent that the voice is female? So I'm going to jump to the bottom and see what the unpopular commenters are saying. Personally, I think it still makes sense if it was the Cranog Man, who is the Laughing Tree, when he just came from the God's Eye with the island full of werewoods. All right, next thread. This is about a video made by Alt Shift X. It's from six years ago, May 20, 2017. Who is the Knight of the Laughing Tree? Top comment, 49 points. Wait, it's never specifically mentioned the Cranhog Man was Howland? No, but there's no doubt that it is. So at this stage, I can see that a lot of readers are still um, still getting the facts together. Like today, it's considered common knowledge that the Cranog Man was Howland, because he's the only Cranog Man in the story. Basically, um, he's only named one, and um, Ned, in his thoughts, refers to him as the Cranog Man, and so do other characters. I think Jojen is a Cranog Man too, but he's not quite a man yet, or he's a he's a brand new man. I think he's like a teenager now. 
Brandwarg's blank is a panacea for most theories. Yeah, so one of the theories about the Night of the Laughing Tree is that Bran was like time traveling and skin changing someone. <laughs> Very few people like that theory. I don't like it either. Just because time travel is kind of stupid. I love the thought that R plus L really kicked off because of the Night of the Laughing Tree. Especially since Rhaegar crowned her the Queen of Love and Beauty, pretty much out of nowhere later during the tourney. And this person responds, besides all the major problems with Lyanna being the knight, it's completely unnecessary to justify Rhaegar becoming interested in Lyanna. That's an interesting point. And then he quotes Teacher Squire's Honor, that shall be ransom enough. Anybody at all looking into the Knight of the Laughing Tree will start their investigation wondering why the hell the knight wanted the squires to be taught honor instead of taking the ransom, which they clearly needed considering they have mismatched armor and not a full set. That's right, the Knight of the Laughing Tree was wearing mismatched armor. Why did the squires being taught honor mean so much when the knight clearly needed the ransom? Or at least looked like they did. So they'll ask the knights about their squires, and the squires will eventually have to confess about the incident between them and Lyanna and Howland. Therefore, any investigation into the knight's identity leads the investigator to Lyanna anyways. She doesn't have to be the knight for her to catch the interest of Rhaegar, considering Rhaegar and Robert and Richard and whoever else will speak with her anyways once it comes to light about the Squire incident. Yeah, that's a good point. Mark G. 171. He comes up a lot in these threads refuting the possibility that it was Lyanna and arguing for the possibility that it was Ned. And while this point is pretty strong, that anybody investigating the identity of the Knight of the Laughing Tree would have ended up talking to Liana anyway. It doesn't do much work in moving the needle of public opinion away from the Knight being Liana, because it creates an opportunity for Rhaegar and Liana to meet, and because the body of evidence that John's parentage is important and that John's parents are Rhaegar and Liana is so big and well known in the audience now that some opportunity for some sort of romantic meeting between Rhaegar and Lyanna seems almost mandatory at this point, from a narrative standpoint. And so that's what I meant about um, Night of the Laughing Tree theories being couched in R plus L equals J. Where the apparent and wide sweeping validity of R plus L equals J seems to be driving the insistence that the Knight of the Laughing Tree was Lyanna Stark. And proponents of Lyanna Stark for Knight of the Laughing Tree are very straightforward about that, being their reasoning. And so what you'll see constantly happening in the Knight of the Laughing Tree debates is that there's a tension between what would make the story a good story versus which literal details best fit the answer to the mystery. Some readers are more willing to suspend their disbelief since A Song of Ice and Fire has established a really high standard of quality for its believability, for details like combat ability, jousting ability, height, weight, sex, um, clothing, armor, and so on, where all these things can be the difference between who wins or loses a fight, a battle, or a war, a lot of readers are unwilling to set their demand for uh, that same level of realism aside, in order to allow for Lyanna Stark being the Knight of the Laughing Tree to be true and add all of that narrative cohesion to the story and R plus L equals J, and make it a good story as a whole. And then you have readers who tend in the opposite direction, where they're less attached to the narrative cohesion that Lyanna is Knight of the Laughing Tree. As to the story's central mysteries and everything we think we know about them, especially when it comes to sacrificing the unforgiving realism that the story has established itself with so far. 
A Song of Ice and Fire is the kind of story where um, if you're Oberyn Martell, even though you're in the right, Oberyn Martell is winning the fight against the mountain, and he's about to finally get his revenge against the big evil mountain who killed his sister. He takes a moment to gloat, and the mountain ceases upon that moment to smash his head in, because he was too overconfident to wear a helmet. And so that tension is at the core of these arguments about the Night of the Laughing Tree, and it's, uh, it's a really interesting tension because it strikes at the heart of what a fantasy story, and by extension, what the fantasy genre is. We approach fantasy with the understanding that it sacrifices some realism. In order to increase the contrast and turn up the volume, and amplify the archetypes and all that. To better convey the story's ethic, basically. It's philosophies. Usually to children and young adults, who, um, being young, have a harder time staying interested in something like a book. All right, on to the next thread. Five years ago, January 29, 2018. Who is the Knight of the Laughing Tree? What are the best theories out there for the identity of this mystery knight? I've read of Liana and of Howland, even of Bran warging into someone. Is there a theory out there about it being Ned? I was pretty convinced it was Liana, but someone made an argument about it being Ned, and now I'm intrigued. Most likely Liana. It explains why Rhaegar went missing for a bit when he was sent out to find the identity of the Mystery Knight. Also ties nicely into how they meet slash fell in love. The booming voice that came from under the helm is interesting, and there are some pretty cool fucking theories on it, such as Bran going back into the past and working into Howland Reed or someone else, but could just as easily have been the sound of someone with a high-pitched voice that was being muffled under all that metal. The high-pitched voice of a woman. The booming voice part would be such a lame excuse. Hey, I don't do the writing. I mean, this is relying on assumptions to begin with, like Lyanna being in love with Rhaegar, which we don't really know. Narratively, I don't think it can be anyone other than Lyanna. The very investigation into the knight's identity inevitably leads to Lyanna as the first thing to investigate. Is why the Knight of the Laughing Tree so publicly accepted honor, being taught to the defeated knight's squires as ransom, despite clearly being, or at least looking, poor. So it's Mark again, making the same point we've read before. Um, five or so years later. I will eat my hat if Liana isn't the Knight of the Laughing Tree. I think it is a green man. That's Ken I try to. He's a regular around here too. He makes super low effort posts, but he's very consistent about it. And um, he gets people talking. Mark says the knight was Ned. We know from Arya that Harwin, Rob, and John, those three at least, were all taught how to joust at Winterfell, and she remembers watching them. John also mentions that Rob is a better lance than him. Brandon himself is jousting in the tourney. Jousting is taught at Winterfell, and so Ned would have been taught to joust as a boy. He'd have especially been taught and made to joust when he moved to the Vale, where knighthood and tourneys are very popular. Robert, the man he was warded alongside, after all, was said to joust, even if he preferred the melee. Ned would have plenty of experience jousting due to being a ward of John Aaron's, even if he himself possibly chose not to enter the lists. Or at least not enter every tourney he went to with John and Robert. The knight does literally everything correct, enters the lists, salutes the king, rides to the pavilions, challenges the champions, unhorses them, waits for them to come attempt to ransom their armor and horses, etc. The knight has clearly been to a tourney or two before. Ned has the most experience with tourneys due to his time in the Vale. 
Ned tells us that John Aaron taught both he and Robert how to make a voice that can be heard in battle. Robert proceeds to use that exact voice John taught them at the hand's tourney, and Ned describes it as a booming voice. John also tells a story of how Ned taught Rob and him how being able to be heard in battle is incredibly important, and that they used to practice trying to be heard across vast distances. Ned therefore can make the booming voice the knight did. So it's kind of interesting that the phrase booming voice in the Night of the Laughing Tree arguments is so central. Even people who propose Liana as the Night of the Laughing Tree usually do so with a caveat, and the caveat is, I can't explain the booming voice. <laughs> and then here we have passages of Ned having been taught how to make a booming voice for combat purposes, and then Ned teaching it to his kids. His sons, anyway. The knight is described in the story as being short of stature, as well as slim in the world of ice and fire. John is described as looking exactly like a younger version of Ned from many different sources, including Ned himself. From our very first introduction to John, Bran notes that John isn't big and muscular, nor growing every day like Rob, also known as slim and short. After saving Giora's life, John is given a long claw, and Giora says that John is too short to wear it at his hip, and needs to wear it on his back. So his point there is that John looks like Ned, and John is short, therefore Ned was short. And so he fits the short of stature description. As of A Dance with Dragons at age 17, John is still wearing it on his back. Stannis Baratheon is also said to tower above John. John is short, and he's 17. Ned was 18 at Harrenhal. That's correct. If John looks like Ned did when Ned was younger, then Ned was also slim and short. Conveniently enough, Kat says that when she first met Ned, a year later when he was 19, she was disappointed by how much shorter he was than Brandon. He continues, Ned offers Howland a space in his tent to sleep. That same night, Howland goes and prays for someone to avenge him against the knights. The person most likely to have walked in on Howland praying, and therefore to have known Howland wanted revenge, as Howland said nothing at the feast, is Ned, considering Ned is the one who would notice Howland isn't in their tent. They'd also be the only one to know that Howland has asked the gods for help, and not the Starks which would require dressing as a mystery knight. So he thinks that Ned was a mystery knight, and that the reason Ned needed to disguise himself was because Howland prayed for help from God, not from Ned. And so presumably Ned wanted to um, let Howland believe it was help from God. But I should point out that he says something incorrect here. Howland did actually ask the Starks for help. It says so directly in the Night of the Laughing Tree story. Jojen spends the whole story repeatedly asking Bran if specifically Ned had ever told this story. Jojen seems to think Ned was the knight. That's a bit of a leap. Um, it suggests that Jojen heard this story from his father. It doesn't necessarily suggest that Jojen thinks Ned was the knight. The knight wants the other knights to chastise their squires and teach them honor. Ned is the most honor-obsessed one there, and Ned is rich enough that he needs neither horses nor armor, and thus can be completely satisfied with just the honor lesson for ransom. That's a great point. Um, whoever the mystery knight is, the more poor they are, the less his his actions make sense. Um, because he does give up the, the wealthy armor and horses that he could have kept. Ned tells Bran that the current Kingsguard aren't the best knights in the realm, like they used to be. One of those knights is, of course, Sir Boros Blount. House Blount's sigil is a porcupine, and they're the only house who has one. One of the champions the knight defeated was the Porcupine Knight. 
Boros is the only Knight of House Blount we've ever heard of. And he seems exactly like the kind of guy who would have been lax in teaching his squire honor. If Ned defeated Boros at Harrenhal and had witnessed that Boros was doing a poor job teaching his squire, then it helps explain why Ned is sure the Kingsguard have declined. Because he beat one. And he beat one in the same tourney where he watched Oswa went, defend his title for at least a day. He's the only initial champion not said to fall at the end of the first day, but we don't know when he eventually loses. He watched Arthur make it to the semifinals, and he watched Barrison make it to the finals. Boros was lesser than them, but Ned beat him. Ned is the only one who can check off everything. And he goes through bullet points for Lyanna, Brandon, Benjen. And the reason I'm reading so much of this post is because it gets referenced throughout a lot of the threads to come after it. He makes a pretty compelling case for, for the Knight of the Laughing Tree being Ned. And he becomes pretty well known in these debates because of it. Mark G171. I love this post. This person says, the thing I can't help but come back to about this is that although Ned makes more sense as the Knight of the Laughing Tree realistically, Liana makes more sense narratively. I was just saying this. The Knight being Ned doesn't really add anything except flavor, and even that flavor doesn't really make sense. Ned's the guy that admits to not competing in tourneys, and says, the man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. Neither of those statements adds up to someone who disguises himself to go jousting for justice. Well, it depends on what his reason is for disguising himself. Even if he did, all that adds to the story is that Ned went against his principles to do the right thing. Except, we get a direct insight into how Ned thinks when he ponders this very subject. There's endless promise me Neds. We also see how much it eats him up inside simply to write my heir instead of Joffrey and Robert's will. Meanwhile, he never once internally even alludes to anything about the Knight of the Laughing Tree. On the other hand, Lyanna has a much bigger narrative need to be the Knight of the Laughing Tree. The reader has already had some firm hints dropped throughout the text that Lyanna didn't fit Robert's romantically chivalrous ideal of her. This story fleshes that out. All we learn about Lyanna before and after this story fits. She has more martial training than Ned suspected. We later see her secretly practicing swords with Benjen, though one of, through one of Bran's visions. And she's passionate and unorthodox, as we know from her probably running away with Rhaegar. If she is the Knight of the Laughing Tree, that gives weight to all those other character traits. The reader isn't just told she's a badass, we're shown she's a badass. This version of the story doesn't only lend weight to Lyanna being a badass, but also to explain how Lyanna and Rhaegar fell in love. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. So, great counterpoints to uh, Ned for Lyanna. I don't agree with all of them in either case. Entering as a mystery knight on a tournament seems completely out of character for Ned. The knight is described as short of stature, which seems to indicate either Howland himself, or more likely Lyanna. Then they argue about whether or not Ned is short, or how short he is. Gotta be Howland and Lyanna. This thing was a setup from the start. Howland supposedly just happens to stumble upon the biggest tournament ever. And Howland is supposed to be this feared fighter, but he gets beaten up by a couple squires? I want to, I should point out that it was three squires, and that they were all a few years younger than him. Doesn't seem likely. Everyone thinks that when Rhaegar finds the Mystery Knight, that it is Lyanna, and I agree. But before that, the Mystery Knight was Howland. So he thinks the Mystery Knight was two people, and they switched places. 
First it was Hal, and then it was the owner. One thing we know about the Mystery Knight is that they have a booming voice, which Liana doesn't have. So Howland creates this plan where he gets himself beaten up, then gets revenge by beating the Mystery Knight, then convinces Liana to seduce Rhaegar by pretending to be the Knight. Boom, boom, that's what happened. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. But points for, points for originality. I think it is a green man who came in response to Howland's prayers. Nobody, almost nobody thinks it's a green man. But it's funny because that's a, a distinct possibility. <laughs> After all, the green men are who the Cranog man prayed to for help. And then he got help. And, um, and one point against it being a green man is that green men sometimes have antlers. But the thing about sometimes is that it means sometimes they don't have antlers. So it could still be a green man. This person says, I believe it's the Ned. Simple and sweet. All right, to the next thread. <clears throat> this is also from five years ago, January 31, 2018. Another Night of the Laughing Tree theory. The fan community has largely conformed around the theory that the Night of the Laughing Tree is Lyanna Stark which probably means that it won't be. Not certainly, after all. The fans were right about R plus L equals J. I, for one, have always found that theory unsatisfying. I don't see much mystery in that theory. And I, and I don't find much romance in Rhaegar falling in love with Lyanna when he finds her out as the knight in disguise. I think my own much less common theory is a more satisfying, more romantic, and all around a better answer to this mystery. I believe it's Rhaegar. <clears throat> this is unique. I don't see Rhaegar very often. He continues, Now there are some holes in my theory. For instance, the knight was described as short of stature, while Rhaegar, as he's been described, was on the taller side. But the Lyanna theory has holes too, like the knight speaking in a deep, booming voice. It would be really bizarre for Lyanna to be able to imitate a deep, booming male voice. Either way, both theories have contradictions that will need to be explained when the identity of the knight is finally revealed. I would be very interested in asking this person how good or evil he thinks the Mad King was. Both theories have in common an explanation of how Rhaegar and Lyanna first met and fell in love. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. Um... Most of what we're going to see now is just going to be rehashes. And so I'm going to try to sort of speed run through it. He says, great theory until the first day and everyone is wondering where the prince is, meaning Prince Rhaegar. But oh wait, look, a mystery knight. Then the second day, everybody is wondering where the mystery knight is. Oh wait, look, the prince is jousting now. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. Rhaegar is just too noticeable to go missing while there is a mystery knight. Counterpoints are the mystery knight didn't need to be present all day. Royalty can demand privacy anytime they want. Or slip away from their followers unnoticed. It seems almost impossible. Rhaegar was participating in the tourney too. Okay, next topic. This is from westeros.org. It's a poll. It says, answer 10 mysteries of A Song of Ice and Fire. I'm only interested in number two and number four right now. Number two is, who is the mystery knight of Harrenhal? Laughing tree. And number four is, who is John's mother? And here are their answers. Lyanna Stark and Lyanna Stark. Lyanna Stark, I'm sure about this. Lyanna Stark, again, I'm sure about this. Answer number three. Paris Hilton and Arthur Dane. I think those are jokes. This one says Lyanna Stark most likely. Lyanna Stark by Rhaegar Targaryen. So he specifies the father. 
even though that isn't part of the question. Next answer, Liana Stark for Night of the Laughing Tree, Liana for John's mother. Next answer, Liana Stark and Liana Stark. Next answer, Liana and Liana because that's the only way Ned's actions concerning John make any sense. Also, Rhaegar is John's dad. Oh, this is from 2018, by the way. Who is the mystery knight laughing tree? Liana. Who is John's mother? I expect it to be Liana, but would be thrilled if RLJ was a red herring. So here's another um, sort of a smaller trend. There are some readers who are excited by the idea that R plus L equals J is wrong. And... Uh, other readers tend to call them contrarians, like they don't really have a good reason for wanting that or uh, much evidence to support it or to refute the evidence of R plus L equals J. But, um, but they just like the idea of the story being surprising to R plus L equals J proponents, which is almost everybody. Next answer for Night of the Laughing Tree is Liana. And for Jon Snow's mother is Lyanna. It is known. Next one, Lyanna and Lyanna. Next one, Lyanna and Lyanna. Next, Lyanna and Lyanna. Next, Lyanna and Lyanna. And so this goes on for six pages, I think. Lyanna and Lyanna. Leona Stark, Leona Stark. Leona Stark, Leona Stark. Just to make sure that we understand that they don't mean Leona Mormont. The mystery knight is Leona. John's mother is Leona. Huh. The mystery knight is Ned Stark. So that's the first non Leona answer. But John's mother is Leona. <laughs> Liana and Liana. Liana. Liana, fathered by Brandon Stark. Hmm. That's gross. Mance Raider was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. And John's mother is a Shara Dane. Those are different. Liana, Benjamin, and Howland read by turns. So this person thinks the Night of the Laughing Tree was three people. They switched off. But John's mother is Liana. This one says the Night of the Laughing Tree was either Ned or Liana. They're not sure. And this one says John's mother was either Ashara or Liana. But they're not sure. Liana and Liana. Let me skip to the last page, see if it's still the same. Liana, and I really hope it's a Shara or some commoner, but probably Liana. All right, next thread. Five years ago, about the Night of the Laughing Tree. I know the popular theory is that Liana was the knight, and a lot seems to indicate that, but how realistic is it really? At the time of the Harrenhal tourney, she was what, around 16 years old? She was 14 to 15, actually. Sure, she is described as wild and good at riding, but also as small and petite. So how realistic is it that a 16-year-old girl would be able to easily beat not one, but three seasoned knights. Top comment, 24 points. Jamie said that jousting is three quarters horsemanship. That's right, Jamie, Jamie did say that. Well, he thought it, but it's the same thing. It's as realistic as your suspension of disbelief allows it to be, smiley face. <laughs>
Jousting in George R. R. Martin's Westeros is more about skill with the lance and horsemanship than it is about being a large, muscular man. All right, so here's the quote from Jamie. It says, Jamie thinks to himself, Jousting was three quarters horsemanship, Jamie had always believed. Sir Loras rode superbly and handled a lance as if he'd been born holding one, which no doubt accounted for his mother's pinched expression. He puts the point just where he means to put it, and seems to have the balance of a cat. Perhaps it was not such a fluke that he unhorsed me. It was a shame that he would never have the chance to try the boy again. So there's Jamie thinking about jousting um, and Loris. According to the rules set by the author in the text, it is extremely plausible. I've met some 16-year-olds I wouldn't want to fight. Uh, just a reminder, she was 15, not 16. Does Ned's name ever get thrown around? He's never been labeled attorney fighter, and I believe that is because, for the most part, these kind of attorneys are southern in nature. That's correct. But he was warded in the Vale, and surely John Aaron would have him train in sword and lance. Unquestionably, that's also correct. And he was shy to begin with, so going as Mystery Knight would make sense, no? It was Ned, but people don't see him as a secret knight, good jouster, or someone who can have fun at tournament. But this is young Ned. He was happy there. He was shy and is someone who would use Laughing Tree as a sigil. It makes perfect sense that he entered competition as a mystery knight, beat three knights, and talk about honor. Yeah, so that's one of the stronger points in favor of Ned, I think. That Ned is, uh, he's very interested in honor, being honorable, and so was the mystery knight. I always thought the knight was Ned. I mean, the knight of the laughing tree wants the knights to teach their squires honor, and that screams Ned. While Howland comments about the knight being short, Jamie tells us Eris thought he was the mystery knight, and Jamie is a tall Lannister. So 18 years old Ned could have the same build as 15 years old Jamie. At 12 or 13, Joffrey was actually taller than John when he visited Winterfell. I've actually never seen that point made, but that's a fair point. According to Mad King Aerys Targaryen, the Mystery Knight could have been someone as tall as Jaime Lannister. They weren't very good knights. Oh, I see. So that's, um, he's arguing for Lyanna. He's saying the knights were actually just that bad. It wasn't so much that Lyanna was so great at jousting. I think it makes some sense, but the more I think about it, the less sense it makes. Because this is the biggest tourney in uh, over a decade, I think, and the prizes are three times larger than the prizes at House Lannister's tourney, who are rich. So the competition here would be as stacked as it could possibly be. All the best competitors for jousting would be here, which means that there would be a lot less room for crappy jousters in the lists. Jousting is mainly about riding, and Lyanna is well known to have been an excellent rider. Here's Mark G again. He says, the knight was Ned. And he links to his um, long post that I read earlier. And Illyrio Moparty is another regular around here. Is convinced. He says, it does away with the standard rationale for Rhaegar crowning Lyanna, which I've always felt was kind of meh. The standard rationale for Rhaegar crowning Lyanna is that Rhaegar fell in love with Lyanna's beauty and or moral fiber um, when he found out that she was the hero who uh, avenged the Cranog men, basically. Intervened, let's say. There's some argument about uh, whether it was revenge or justice or what. But there can't be any argument that the Night of the Laughing Tree intervened. Anyone else think it was just Howland Reed himself? 
It is almost too obvious, and that's why everyone thinks it's Liana. I thought it was Benjen. <laughs> so Benjen's role in this story is that he's sort of the helper. He's sent to gather armor for the Cranog Man. Because the Cranog Man doesn't have armor to joust, but he wants to joust. But the Cranog Man decides not to do it because he knows that he can't joust. And that he can hardly ride a horse, even. She was 14, and it's utterly unrealistic that she beats three grown men, no matter how good she was on a horse. But that doesn't really impact anyone's judgment when assessing this theory. There are plenty of moments that rely on your suspension of disbelief. This is probably another one of them. And if Gurm said she did it, well, I guess she did it. George R. R. Martin has not said who the Knight of the Laughing Tree is yet. Neither in the story nor in interviews. If I remember correctly, she beat them in jousting. It's not too far-fetched because that contest requires a lot less physical power, as opposed to something like a melee, and a lot on horsemanship. I always thought it was luck. Okay, next thread. This is from June 2019. Was Liana the Knight of the Laughing Tree in your head cannon? There's a picture of her. Pretty sure she is in George's head cannon too. <laughs> 541 upvotes. It's the only theory that really clicks. 548 points. Could be a green man. 102 points. It was 100% Liana. It is what Ned is referring to when he says that Liana and Brandon's wolf blood got them killed. 94 points. Absolutely. Zero doubt. 87 points. Probably. And Rhaegar found her and saved her from Eris. 56 points. I am almost certain that Liana is the Knight of the Laughing Tree. Yep. There is no doubt in my mind. In my head canon, yes. Radio Westeros has a great breakdown of it that finally convinced me once and for all. That's true. Radio Westeros has a great episode about the Night of the Laughing Tree. I'm sure I listened to it, but it was a long time ago. Yeah, the text basically says that she is. 100%. They compare Liana to Arya frequently in the books. So I think to myself, would Arya do it? She'd knock some motherfuckers off their horse. <laughs> so that's another important part of the Night of the Laughing Tree discussions. Just as John's likeness to Ned is important in evidencing Ned was the Night of the Laughing Tree, Arya's likeness to Liana is important in evidencing that Liana was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. Because John and Arya are present-day living characters, unlike Liana, and now Ned, who have a lot more space on page, and we get to see them doing a lot of things, like riding horses and beating people up. Without a shadow of a doubt, I think this is pretty much canon. No other person makes as much sense. I really can't see any better options. I'm fully convinced that was George R. R. Martin's intention. If anyone has any other theory or options, I'd love to hear them. But as it stands, for me it's Liana. I thought it was Howland Reed. I think it was Liana. She was defending Howland Reed's honor. No doubt. Now, nah, Howland Reed was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. Yes. Being a Stark, I'm sure she was a total badass. No. Where did her booming voice come from? From doing a deep voice like in Mulan, but amplified by an iron helmet. That's the common rationale for her, the booming voice is that the helmet amplified her voice to uh, 
make it sound bigger than it was. Was and is. Isn't Ned also a pretty good candidate? It may as well be confirmed. No, it's definitely Ned. Yes, I think she was. Yes, but without the bulge on her breastplate. <laughs> no, never. Only Halvin Reed is this mystery knight. The only part that doesn't add up is the booming voice. I don't know how could Leona produce a booming voice being 14. Okay, next thread. This is from September 27, 2019. The Night of the Laughing Tree. I am not going to claim this theory as mine, but a few days ago, I read about a guy's comment about how the Night of the Laughing Tree is Ned. While it is a common perception that Liana is the Night of the Laughing Tree, fighting for the rights of innocence without taking credit for it is a thing that we can very much attribute to Ned's personality. Are there any points to prove or disprove this theory? <clears throat> the top comment says, Mira carrying around a helmet and talking about the Knight of the Laughing Tree suggests that the Mystery Knight was a woman. So that's something relatively uh, new to me anyway. And so people who think the Knight of the Laughing Tree was a woman, whether Liana or Ashara or whoever, say that Mira carrying the helmet is the author symbolically supporting the uh, helmet makes the booming voice arguments on behalf of those women. I'd actually love it to be Ned, not only the best character morally, but also a secret badass? Sign me up. Secret badass? Ned couldn't even ask Ashara for a dance. <laughs> the Ned may have wanted to fight for the rights of innocent without taking credit for it, but he is not known as a jouster, or even that he has learned jousting. That's not true. All boys at Winterfell learn how to joust. Um, they just don't have jousting tournaments. But they learn it presumably because they know that uh, most of Westeros joust, and they're part of Westeros. <laughs> Additionally, Ned didn't spend his entire childhood or adolescence at Winterfell. He was fostered in the Vale, which is further south, where they do actually have tournaments, and where he and Robert did joust. All right, next thread. Four years ago, September 2019, The Night of the Laughing Tree. Oh, this is the same thread. Sorry, it's a duplicate, I think. Why Liana being the Night of the Laughing Tree is a ridiculous concept within the series. So it is pretty commonly believed in the fandom that Liana is the Night of the Laughing Tree. I, as the title suggests, think that if this is the case, then it is one of the most nonsensical occurrences in a series that is so praised for its realism. So let's remind ourselves of what happened. I'm going to skip that. I just find this to be ridiculous. How is this capable of happening, and do people genuinely believe to, this to be the case? For a series to be so praised on its realism to have the reasoning for this event, to basically just be that Lyanna, who is from the good house Stark, to beat the three bad knights who are from unnoticeable or bad houses, such as Frey, due to the power of friendship and plot armor? I can't help but remind myself of Oberyn versus the Mountain. This one dude rapes a guy's sister, so he fights him in a battle to the death, and he ends up dying because one's morality is irrelevant in a fight. This is not meant to be a story of morality always prevailing. It's about realism and the harsh truth. And this is why Liana being the Knight of the Laughing Tree is a ridiculous concept within the series. I don't have anything to add to that. I think it speaks for itself. But by now you can see what the two sides are pretty clearly in the Laughing Tree arguments. And what the hot issues are. There's one about a booming voice. There's one about... The plausibility of a teenage girl or a young woman 
jousting and winning against um, three grown men. There's the issue of what makes a good jouster, how much of an effect weight has and momentum and musculature and height and even arm strength comes up. Next thread, January 29, 2020. Is everyone convinced that Liana is the Knight of the Laughing Tree? Who are the other options, Ned or Howland? Liana is the best bet. 180 points. Next thread. This one's a poll, so we get a visual of how many people think which character is the Knight of the Laughing Tree. <laughs> It's a poll from March 31, 2020. Who do you think is the Knight of the Laughing Tree? And there's 2,000 votes for the Honest Stark in first place. In second place, there's 322 votes for Howland Reed. In third place, there's 186 votes for a question mark. Apparently that means I don't know. And then there's 71 votes for Ned Stark. 66 for Rhaegar, and 66 for Ashara. And I love these polls because the results of all of them are about the same. It's almost everybody thinks Lyanna. A very distant second is usually Howland. And then a very distant third is usually Ned. I think there's three or four polls like this we're going to see. The comments say... It's Liana. It has to be Liana. It's Liana. I like the idea of Howland being the knight. As a sort of blood raven assisted in nerd rage. Although it's definitely Liana. <laughs> so Howland with the help of blood raven. That's a new one. Liana makes a lot more sense than Howland. Okay, next thread. November 12th, 2020. My dad and I nearly killed each other, arguing over the Night of the Laughing Tree. Who is more correct? This one looks juicy. So my dad and I are staunchly opposed on the issue. He has the idea that Ned was the knight due to, one, a lack of actual physical written evidence that it wasn't anyone else. This is the most difficult to refute, to be honest. Two, Howland and Ned are extremely close after the tourney. Three, Howland slept in Ned's tent the night before the night arrived. Four, the booming voice of the night. Five, Ned was extremely close with Liana. He thinks it's like a promise me Ned situation. Six, Liana's small stature and lack of prowess in combat. He attests that since she only beat squires, it's not a true test of ability. Meanwhile, me, like a sane person, believes that Liana was the knight. I listed my evidence. So we've already read most of all of that. The main metric I tend to use, though it's far from foolproof, is what answer is more narratively appropriate and satisfying? And to this, the clear answer is Liana, in my opinion. If Liana is the knight, it tells us a lot about her as a character. We don't get to find out any other way. I am pretty sure it's supposed to be Howland with aid of the old gods. Elia Sand is one of Ober and Martell's daughters. She is fond of horses and jousting, and her weapon of choice is the lance. She is called Lady Lance. I think this is George R. R. Martin's way of telling that a woman, Liana, could joust and be the Knight of the Laughing Tree. That's another interesting point that gets brought up. In uh, the Winds of Winter sample chapters, a character named Lady Lance is introduced. And I don't think anybody's going to quote it in these, in these threads we're looking at, but um, I will eventually, before this Knight of the Laughing Tree series is over. I don't want to be physically harmed by you or your father. 
but I do side with you on this. <laughs> and don't forget the night was described as short. I believe Liana is the night of the laughing tree as well, but I think the conclusion is well founded. Okay, next thread. Two years ago, February 28, 2021. Liana equals Knight of the Laughing Tree is as settled as R plus L equals J. This is my favorite thread title. <laughs> as in, not entirely, but come on, people. He points out that Brand guesses Howland Reed is the mystery knight. Ergo, by the most inviolable narrative principle that any solution to a mystery the author straight up gives you is wrong, it's definitely not Howland Reed any more than Daenerys or John are as or a high reborn. Yeah, I said it. Moving on. <laughs> when the squires bully Howland, Lyanna shows up and starts beating them with a stick, evidencing that she is pissed off enough to fight these people over the incident. Benjen the pup tells Howland Reed in front of Lyanna he could hook him up with all the stuff he needs to play Mystery Knight, but Howland doesn't agree to it. This point is interesting. He says, According to George R. R. Martin, horsemanship is the primary determinant of a good jouster, and not something like physical strength. This is why Loris is so good at it. And then he quotes the passage from A Feast for Crows, Jamie 2, where Jamie is thinking, jousting was three quarters horsemanship. But then I think, well, this isn't according to George R. R. Martin, then. This is according to Jamie Lannister. <laughs> George R. R. Martin may have written it. You can't make the leap that that's what the author thinks, too. The knight speaks in a very deep voice, despite being notably small and therefore fairly unlikely to have one. Affecting a suspiciously deep voice is what a teenage girl trying to pretend to be a man might be expected to do. For reference, watch Mulan, the good one. Wait a minute. The deep voice is the thing that most contradicts the idea that Liana was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. But here he's saying actually the strong evidence that, that it was Liana. Because um, that's what a teenage girl would do. She would overcompensate with her voice to try to make it deeper than it should be. <laughs> I'm glad we ran into this point because... It shows that no matter how strong the contradiction, it's always possible to imagine a rationalization for how it might not be a contradiction. Top comment, 349 points. Liana being the Knight of the Laughing Tree and Rhaegar discovering this fits quite well with Rhaegar crowning Liana, Queen of Love and Beauty. Another answer, like Ned was the Knight of the Laughing Tree and Rhaegar found out, implies that Rhaegar crowned Lyanna Queen of Love and Beauty because her brother is cool? And one person responds, This. It is always RLJ deniers who also reject Lyanna, being the Knight of the Laughing Tree. I love this comment because it points out an important correlation. Two of them, actually. One intentionally and one unintentionally. The first one is the one he's saying. There's a correlation between people who deny that Rhaegar and Lyanna are John's parents and people who reject that the Knight of the Laughing Tree was Lyanna. But if it's true that there is a correlation between those two things, then it must also be true that there's a correlation between people who believe that Rhaegar and Lyanna are John's parents and Lyanna was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. And as I said earlier, the theories about Lyanna being the Knight of the Laughing Tree are couched in the theories that Rhaegar and Lyanna are John's parents. And this person says it's partially pure contrarianism, but more charitably, also partially a fundamentally different view on what the series is. If you think Ice and Fire is thematically simple, but narratively complex, you'll probably tend to gravitate towards things like, it's not R plus L equals J, it's in AJ, BAJ, etc. Liana isn't the, the Knight of the Laughing Tree. It's Ned or Benjen or etc. Blood Raven isn't the Three Eyed Crow. Basically, for each of these theories, 
The narrative is super duper complicated, while the thematic payoff is almost non-existent. There, he's describing what I was describing earlier, that um, there's a tension between the mundane facts that need to match in order for a person to qualify as the Knight of the Laughing Tree. Height, sex, jousting ability, riding ability, interest in honor, and so on. And then there's a the question of what would make A Song of Ice and Fire a good story as a whole. And with R plus L equals J being so thoroughly fleshed out, and all but confirmed, the story seems to need Rhaegar and Lyanna to meet and fall in love. And what better opportunity than the Night of the Laughing Tree? This person says, It's really hard to argue that the Night of the Laughing Tree story has any narrative purpose at all if Lyanna is not the knight. Like, if she's not, if the story isn't there to tell you something that's important to the plot and can't be conveyed in some more immediate way, most writers would excise it. Why would it be important to tell this story at this length if it doesn't explain both how Rhaegar and Lyanna met and why he gave her the tourney crown? Why is it important for us to know that if we're not learning the story of how John's parents met. People tend to not think of this in terms of how novels are structured and edited either. So there's a very pronounced attitude forming on the Liana side of the arguments, where, where the attitude is that we understand how story works better than everyone who disagrees with us, that Liana proponents have a better sense of what makes a good story. And the idea is that what makes a good story is something like uh, thematic cohesion. And you find the same attitude in uh, proponents of non Liana characters, where they actually say the same sorts of things. Like, uh, I think it would make a better story if Ned were the knight, or if Brandon were the knight, or Rhaegar, or Benjen, or Ashara, or Barristan, or whoever. But to my ears and eyes, the attitude sounds much more pronounced on the Liana side of the argument. And the treatment of non-Liana proponents worsens over time, as unanimity about Liana being the Knight of the Laughing Tree solidifies, as we'll see in some of the next polls. Next topic. Friday, April 2, 2021. The skinny girl on a stolen horse. How Arya's fleeing Harrenhal parallels Lyanna's grand escape. And the first chapter in it is the section is the Night of the Laughing Tree. He says the first parallel can be found at the very beginning of the Game of Thrones, when eight years old Arya steps up to defend her friend Micah and gives Prince Joffrey a lesson to remember, with nothing more than a wooden stick. It is not unlike Lyanna chasing Island Reed's attackers with her wooden sword and donning the Knight of the Laughing Tree's identity to get him some moral retribution afterwards. And then he quotes a Game of Thrones, Arya II. Lyanna might have carried a sword if my lord father had allowed it. You remind me of her sometimes. You even look like her. That was Ned Stark. In her last chapter of Steel and Snow, The Shadow of Womanly Knighthood, also leans over Arya. So he draws a parallel between Arya beating up Prince Joffrey to defend her friend Micah with a wooden sword, and Lyanna doing the same thing to the squires to defend Halvin Reed. And I have to agree with him. I don't think this parallel is on accident. I would add another parallel of the same kind. Arya uses a wooden sword to beat the crap out of hot pie. Next topic. May 7, 2021. This was only two years ago. Night of the Laughing Tree question. Who painted the shield? Is basically the question. Because we saw in Dunk and Egg that Dunk got his shield painted. I think this is also an important parallel. Um, I actually said this in a previous episode, so I'll just say it again. Dunk getting his shield painted in the Dunk and Egg series 
It was meant to inform why the tree on the night of the laughing tree shield is laughing. Dunk gets the painting that he ordered, but it's not quite what he wanted or was expecting. I think the same thing happened with the night of the laughing tree shield. Where he or she ordered a weirwood tree from somebody who had never seen a weirwood tree before. And so he described it as a, a white tree with red leaves and a face on it. And so that's what he got. And the painter, not knowing that the faces on all the weirwood trees these days are pretty fucking gloomy, the painter made it a happy face. <laughs> because if you're a painter and you want to please your customer, what other face do you put on it? So this commenter says, reading between the lines of the story, it seems highly likely that Liana was the Knight of the Laughing Tree and that Rhaegar succeeded in tracking her down, per his father's command, and that confronting her and confirming this identity is how they met and fell in love. So it stands to reason that the person who painted the shield could serve as the link that Rhaegar used to uncover the Mystery Knight's identity. 25 points. Lots of people think that, but more likely it's Ned. The booming voice is alluded to elsewhere when it's revealed that John Aaron taught Robert, and thus Ned, and not Lyanna, how to make the booming voice. Another thing I haven't seen mentioned, but that I should mention, is that Lyanna is not described as short, so sometimes opponents of Liana being the Knight of the Laughing Tree, challenge that Liana doesn't fit the short of stature description. And then usually the response to that is to point out that um, the other contenders in the tourney were all very tall men. And so even if Liana was not short, by comparison, she would appear short to any onlooker. Here's somebody referencing the Mark G. Post. He says, uh, this has already been debunked in a great way. There is no way Liana would have ever been allowed training in jousting and more. The Knight of the Laughing Tree must be Ned. Now I'm going to go backwards at the expense of the chronological order of things and look at a few specific comments in the threads that we already looked at that I missed. The first two comments are from the thread about Alt-Shift-X's video. Who is the Knight of the Laughing Tree? It says, I haven't seen the vid yet, but it's unambiguously Liana. For the most part, the folks who think it can't be her are the same kind of folks who hate Catelyn Stark more than characters like Viserys or Roos. If you catch my drift. So what do you think he's saying? What's his drift? Well, he named Catelyn Stark Viserys and Roos. Viserys and Roos are considered by and large to be villains. There's some argument about whether Catelyn Stark is mostly a villain, but there's very little argument about that for Viserys and Roos. Viserys is Daenerys' abusive older brother, and Roos is Ramsay Bolton's abusive uh, biological father, and the Lord of the Dreadfort, who skins people alive, and who betrayed Robb Stark. So their villainies are pretty set in stone, but Catelyn's villainy, not so much. The main critique of Catelyn is that she was abusive toward John, but it wasn't a physical kind of abuse. It was a neglectful and exclusionary kind of abuse, where she treated John like an outsider, and tried to pass that along to her kids, um, as we can see in the thoughts of Sansa, successfully in Sansa's case, and unsuccessfully in Arya's case. This commenter seems to detect a commonality between the types of people who argue against the Knight of the Laughing Tree being Lyanna and the types of people who seem to hate Catelyn Stark more than they hate Viserys or Roos. And since Lyanna and Catelyn are both women and Viserys and Roos are both men, I think what he's suggesting is that those readers have a subconscious hatred of women that's coming forth in their treatment and interpretation of these parts of the story. As in, their reason for not thinking the Knight of the Laughing Tree could be Lyanna is that they don't want the Knight of the Laughing Tree to be Lyanna, because they don't want the Knight of the Laughing Tree to be a woman, because they hate women. 
or maybe more generously, they want to preserve a typically male hero role for a man. Because a knight is typically a male hero role. So that would be like a narrative gatekeeping on behalf of uh, men in general. Which would obviously tend to be a self-flattering behavior because the audiences that read fantasy novels, even one as popular among women as this one, are majority male audiences by a large margin. As far as medieval fantasy stories go, A Song of Ice and Fire does pretty well with women. A Song of Ice and Fire has a big female audience, usually credited to the way George R. R. Martin writes women. When George R. R. Martin was asked in an interview how he writes women characters, being a man, to paraphrase his answer, he says that he writes the female characters the same way that he writes the male characters, as if they're a human being. In other words, he doesn't make the human being's sex superordinate to everything else as he's writing it. And it turns out that that works to produce uh, writing of female characters or um, different gender characters from you that people of that gender like and find believable and credible and sympathetic and all this stuff. All those good things a writer would want his readers to think about his story. This commenter says, the arguments for Ned all address in world logic, and not what makes sense in service of a narrative. The reasons for Rhaegar crowning Lyanna explicitly given in the books, such as they are, make no sense. Why is the weirwood tree on the shield laughing? I'm not arguing that Ned never laughs, but a laughing tree makes no sense as a sigil for him. The message is clearly, someone is getting punked. It's an allusion to how audacious it is for Lyanna to don armor and fight. But most importantly, what is the whole theme of Lyanna as a character? The way the theme of Arya is loss of identity. A repeating theme in A Song of Ice and Fire is the agency of women and how it is oppressed by the patriarchal structure. Lyanna is a huge example of this right at the center of the story. She is abducted by Rhaegar, almost certainly going willingly, and quote-unquote raped, bears him children consensually. She probably wanted to marry him and may actually have done so. An entire rebellion was fought with her right in the middle of it, yet the accounts of it have very obviously and conspicuously written her out of the story. So this fits in narratively, because it's Lyanna being literally anonymized being right in the thick of events and going down in history as a big fat question mark. It fits in both with Liana and with the general theme of the story, of the deeds of women being downplayed and marginalized. So yeah, Ned makes sense because he can fight and stuff, but that stuff doesn't matter. This is a narrative puzzle. It's about characters and themes. This comment echoes um, something we saw earlier, where no matter which side you're on, uh, both sides argue that they understand the story better, storytelling. That's kind of what he's saying here at the end. He's saying the technical and mundane details are not as important to the story as the themes. And I think opponents of Liana would agree with that statement, but they might disagree with the theme that he's positing here, or maybe even agree with it, but suggest that He's jumping to conclusions about what the themes are. There's still a lot we don't know about the situation, and there's a lot more story to come. But apparently this commenter's idea of what the themes are resonate with the last commenter, where the very structure of the story's mysteries has the effect of drawing out of the woodworks. Readers who hold unflattering subconscious expectations and therefore beliefs that apparently the author should not give the heroic knighthood to a woman character rather than a man, even if it ruins the themes of the story. And if, like this commenter suggests, Liana's role at the center of the events of Robert's Rebellion and the tourney at Harrenhal is downplayed and marginalized because she's a woman, that would resonate with the same theme and give the story a metatextuality and uh, symbolic representation of its readers that makes it hard to mistake the author's intentions and purpose 
in writing the story in the way that he did, where his purpose apparently was to shine a light on those unflattering attitudes in us, in a portion of his readers, attitudes that marginalize women and downplay their role in everything from history to storybooks. This next comment is from this thread from two years ago, May 7, 2021, Night of the Laughing Tree Question. It says there's a lot more reason for it being Liana than just that. She's described as being an incredible rider, and Jamie says at one point that jousting is mostly horse handling skills. Ned is also never described as a good jouster. Moreover, Mira's entire story is really much more about Liana than anything. It is her who takes Ho and Reed under her protection and introduces her to the rest of the Stark clan. It's her who recognizes the knights. Ned is merely a side character in this tale. So why should he be given the big triumphant moment? Just because Lyanna is a woman and he is a man? So as in the last two comments, this commenter expresses suspicion that there's more driving the insistence that the Knight of the Laughing Tree was Ned or a not Lyanna character than just logic and reason. He thinks the reason that people keep insisting that it's Ned, even though there is a mountain of both thematic and technical kind of evidence, that it's Liana, are willfully opposed to it's Liana for some undiscernible reason. And maybe that reason is that she's a woman. And there's some gatekeeping going on, on the not Liana sides of the argument. To preserve this hero role, which is traditionally male, for a male character, Satisfying the attitude in the mostly male fantasy audience that women can't or shouldn't be heroes and that hero roles or power belong to men. In holding on to the thematic satisfaction that Liana being the Knight of the Laughing Tree would add to the story, he's abandoned a wholly in-story approach to handling the mystery of the Knight of the Laughing Tree and begun treating the answer to the mystery like something that the author distributes, rather than something that happens in world. He says, so why should Ned be given the big triumphant moment? As if that role is given to him by the author, as some sort of reward, rather than earned by Ned the character in story, through in-story machinations, like his characterization, his height, his ability to joust and ride a horse and all that or make a booming voice. And the flip side of that observation is that the people who think it's not Liana are ignoring the story on a thematic level to make the mundane and technical details work. Whoever the Knight of the Laughing Tree is, it's clear that the most popular contenders are Liana, Howland, and Ned. In that order. But I notice that most of the contention in the arguments is happening on the Liana and Ned sides. There's very little frustration about people who say or dispute the possibility that it could be Howland. And so one question I might ask about the Knight of the Laughing Tree situation as a whole is um, why that is the case. Why are arguments so heated when it comes to Liana and Ned, while the biggest challenger to Liana is consistently Howland Reed instead of Ned? Going to the next topic. This is from user Reghalt. Everything requires training, even jousting. The point being that um, Rickard Stark was against Lyanna um, doing masculine sorts of activities like sword fighting, because we see in Brand's vision that she's trying to hide her sword fighting with Benjen from her father. So apparently, Rickard Stark did not approve of Lyanna sword fighting, which suggests that Rickard Stark would not have approved of Lyanna jousting. But I should add that in a World of Ice and Fire app, which is um, considered semi-canon, it's stated that Lyanna practiced jousting in rings. But it's unclear whether she had her father's permission to do that or not. And of course, Lyanna's opponents in the argument will point to the fact that jousting in rings is not the same thing as real jousting experience. I'm starting to lose my voice here. 
Next topic is a poll. Who is the Knight of the Laughing Tree from one year ago, April 26, 2022? <clears throat> he thinks it's the Cranog Man. So in this poll, there's 1,100 votes. 904 for the Anna in first place. In second place, Howard Reed at 134. Third place, Future Bran at 41. Oh, never mind. He thinks it's Future Bran. <laughs> that's why that's an option here. It's Future Bran skin changing into someone. And then Ned at 29. And a green man at 27. And Jamie Lannister at 5. Top comment, 130 points. Says 100% Lyanna Stark. It is obviously Lyanna Stark. It was definitely Lyanna Stark. It was Lyanna, 100%. It's Tywin Lannister, skin changed into the Dusky Woman. <laughs> I think that's a joke. Rodney Dangerfield, another joke. So yeah, people are kind of uh, worn out with the arguments after 10 years. <clears throat> Lyanna Stark. Edmund Tully, of course. Lyanna, not hard to imagine. She's also, she'd also be a good jouster. Time traveling Tyrion. So obviously Lyanna. Easy peasy, Ned 100%. Then he quotes the line, you never heard this tale from your father. Next topic, another poll. This one's even more one-sided than the others. There's 296 votes. Well, hang on. This is from December 9, 2022. 296 total votes. 241 to Lyanna Stark. Second place is Howland Reed at 34. And third place is Eddard Stark at 13. And then Benjamin Stark at 4. Brandon Stark at 3. Ashara Dane at 1. I haven't seen any arguments for Ashara Dane yet, but somehow she's on most of the polls. <laughs> I don't know if that's just um, the idea that it's a woman appeals so much that there should be a second woman on the poll. Or if it's a consequence of some popular new theory. There's a lot of evidence for Liana, but horsemanship notwithstanding, I can't get past her not having any experience that we know of, jousting. Ditto for Howland. So I'm tentatively sticking with Ned. It's exactly the sort of modest thing our quiet wolf would do for his sister and friend, and to avoid giving an explanation to Rickard, should Liana be hurt. Liana, aside from it fitting her personality, it makes sense that when Rhaegar was sent off to find the Knight of the Laughing Tree and returned with only the shield, but the name to Lyanna, Queen of Love and Beauty, he was acknowledging her skill at the joust because he had actually discovered that it was her and not just found her shield in a tree like he said. Booming voice? Can't be a girl's voice, can it? Deep is not the same thing as booming. Women can absolutely have booming voices. Liana, who unconsciously skin-changed her opponent's horses to make them perform poorly. A trick similar to Loras, another rose knight, but with real magic. <laughs> That's a unique idea. She sabotaged the horses by skin changing them, her opponent's horses. I would love for it to have been the old gods giving Howland the strength to fight or even more, 
the old gods enchanting the armor to fight on its own, like in the fairy tales. But it's Westeros. The most likely answer would indeed seem to be Lyanna. I really like that comment because I've been looking for comments kind of like this. It's a kind of comment that seems like he's not happy with the answer he settled on. Right? Like, he would like it to be something different than what he thinks it probably is. He thinks it's probably Liana. But he doesn't seem happy about it. And maybe more to the point is that he thinks Howland being the Knight of the Laughing Tree would be more satisfying than Liana. Oh, here's a fun one. You don't have to like it, but you're going to have to suck it up and accept it that Martin is fine with his world being a place where a 14-year-old girl can joust with grown men. And then he starts to cite Lady Lance. Here it is. September 2019. I feel that I'm the only person who thinks it's Howland. To me, the point of the story, other than the obvious way of providing backstory, is that someone who others underestimate can be capable of great deeds. And I think that's the appeal, largely, of the knight being Howland, to the people who support that the knight was Howland. It doesn't assist the R plus L equals J theory, or any of the big mysteries at the center of the story, and that we love to talk about so much. But it does satisfyingly conclude the Knight of the Laughing Tree story, where it's a story about a, a weak underdog getting beaten up, and then saying a prayer and then being endowed with the ability to get his revenge or justice or retribution or whatever you want to call it. And part of what makes it a satisfying conclusion is that the Knight of the Laughing Tree's story starts out with a very long introduction and descriptions of um, the Cranog Man's visit to the Isle of Faces and the magic that he knows before he went there, that he learned some magic after he left. His reason for going was to learn some, some green men magic. And so the prayer to the Isle of Faces is, in some ways, that visit paying off, where he gets to actually use or at least benefit from what he learned and the friends he made and so on. And I think what's probably at the heart of the appeal of the idea that the Knight of the Laughing Tree was Howland Reed is that if you say that the Knight of the Laughing Tree was Howland Reed, there's almost nobody who's going to be very upset with you. <laughs> Whereas if you say it was Liana or Ned, there's going to be a large group of people pissed off at you. So in the Night of the Laughing Tree discussions, Helen Reed has become sort of a safe haven. He's the option that readers retreat to, to get away from the contentious arguments, because he's a satisfying enough answer to the mystery, even though he's not so satisfying as to make any of us cheer and, and regard the story with awe, the awe you might expect from having invested enough attention and time to read about 5,000 pages of this fantasy story. In my episode about Tyrion and dragons, I talked about the story's theme about nihilism versus hard truth. And the same theme is at play here in Howland Reed. Readers who retreat to Howland Reed as the answer to the Night of the Laughing Tree mystery tend to be people who have noticed that there's some really strong and nasty contentiousness that underlies the arguments about Liana and Ned, and that attempts to talk about the matches or mismatches tend to degenerate into ridicule and name-calling and all the bitterness you would expect from a topic that people have been arguing about for more than 10 years. And they say, I think the mystery knight is the Cranog man, Howland Reed. Now please leave me alone. And if such contentiousness does underlie what should have been a discussion about one of A Song of Ice and Fire's most enjoyable mysteries, it's no wonder that it's making a portion of readers feel like the arguments are so meaningless now that they're willing to sacrifice their expectation of 
and narrative awe and wonder. For a resolution that steals away from the discussions and the story, at least a shred of meaningfulness. A story about a little swamp man, whose studies and determination gave him the power he needed to overcome impossible odds, knock his bullies down a peg with the power of his magical gods, and at the same time make the world a better place by making them better people for it. I think that's going to be the end of this episode, you guys. Sorry I forgot to light the candle. Here, let me light it now. I figure it's kind of appropriate for this episode anyway, because uh, I was mostly just reading things other people wrote. This was kind of a, an obligatory episode to sort of give you the, the lay of the land here with this Night of the Laughing Tree thing and uh, set up the groundwork that I need to make the next episode for the Night of the Laughing Tree. Anyway, uh, Thanks for coming, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, got something out of it. And I'll see you next time.